I'm project chair of Apache Cassandra. I've been doing that for about five years. Uh, four years ago, I started a company called Datastacks to commercialize Cassandra. Uh, we have a booth over in the, the sponsors hall. Uh, you're welcome to stop by and, and find out more about what we're doing with Cassandra. Um, so Cassandra has uh, you know, a, a little bit of a reputation still from the early days as a database primarily used in social media. Um, that impression is, uh, is outdated now. Uh, there's thousands of companies using Cassandra in all kinds of uh, different use cases and different workloads and uh, different business areas. Uh, I'd, I'd like to look at uh, three of those that are representative in, uh, in some ways of how people use Cassandra and use that as a basis for our introduction here. Uh, so the first of those is eBay. So uh, big e-commerce site uses Cassandra in uh, multiple places. Uh, one big one is when you're viewing a, a, an eBay product page, when you're looking at an item for sale, and the, the like and want buttons, uh, those are driven by Cassandra. Uh, there's uh, uh, something called the Hunch Taste Graph, also driven by Cassandra. The Red Laser Time Series uh, Analytics, also by Cassandra. So there's, there's actually lots of different uh, teams at eBay uh, using Cassandra for different things. Um, and there's, there's several different reasons that eBay chose to build these applications on top of Cassandra. And I want to, to look into those uh, in a little more depth. So first of all, uh, a, a, several of, of eBay's applications using Cassandra are for time series data. So when I say time series data, I mean uh, you know, event data that has a chronological component to it. So I've got three examples on this slide. On the left, uh, you have sensor data or monitoring data. Uh, for uh, you know, machines or for an Internet of Things, you know, that kind of data where um, you know, I, I, you know, my temperature was X at 11.45 this morning, uh, it was Y at 11.46. You know, that, that progression of data is a, as an example of time series. Uh, in the upper right, uh, this is a web server activity log. So the log of activities of users on your websites uh, can be useful time series data. Uh, what have my friends been doing on this site? Uh, also an example of time series data. And at the bottom, uh, we have financial market data, uh, also a good example of, of time series. So Cassandra's uh, uh, data model gives you the ability to have uh, sorted data within, uh, within a partition and distribute that across your cluster, which makes it a very good fit for time series. So a lot of people are using it for that. Um, another factor in eBay's uh, review was Cassandra's support for multiple data centers. What I've tried to diagram here is a, a real-world deployment scenario where uh, I have two data centers in the cloud, so in uh, Amazon EC2 or, or Google Compute Engine, uh, and two on-premise data centers. And Cassandra is totally flexible about mixing heterogeneous uh, deployments together like this. Um, it, it's not just uh, multi-data center support in the sense of I can fail over if I have a problem, but rather it's active-active. So each, uh, each user in any of these data centers can perform reads and writes at local latencies, which then get replicated asynchronously to the other data centers. Um, and Cassandra's smart about this. When I'm replicating, to uh, when I know that I need to replicate to machines in another data center, uh, I won't send three copies of that row over the network. I'll send one copy over the WAN, and then the replica that receives it will then forward it to the other uh, 
replicas in, in that other data center. Um, eBay also wanted Cassandra's support for distributed counters. So this it might be a little difficult to see in the back, uh, but what's going on in this slide is uh, I'm showing how Cassandra's counters are partitioned across each replica. So the, the tough part, so you're, you're, you're probably thinking, okay, a counter, I just, you know, update set x equals x plus 1. You know, how hard can that be? Um, so it's, a, it, it's really trivial if you have a single master handling all your updates. It is not trivial if you want to handle this asynchronously across multiple data centers. If I just, if I just had everyone send their increments to a single master, then you know, my latency from, from New York to uh, London you know, is, is going to be you know, 20, 30 milliseconds. That's a lot of latency to add on uh, to each request. Um, so instead, what we do is we, we partition a counter across each replica, and then each replica is authorized to handle increments for its partition. And then the, uh, the information is then propagated to the other replicas asynchronously. So in this diagram, in the upper left, I have a counter whose total value is three because the A partition has a count of three. The other partitions have counts of zero. They haven't handled any increments yet. In the upper right, we're going to handle two simultaneous increments. The A replica and the B replica get requests to increment the counter by two. So A increments its partition by two from three to five. B rec increments its from zero to two. Now notice that it, the, the counter value is inconsistent in this diagram in the upper right because A thinks the value of the counter is 5, B thinks the value is 5, and C thinks the value is 3. So that's, that's because they haven't been able to replicate those updates yet. At the bottom, this is the state after the updates have been replicated. Now every replica knows that the total value of the counter is 7. Um, eBay also was interested in Cassandra's Hadoop support. So let me clarify this a little bit because there's different levels of Hadoop support that a database can provide. Um, you know, at a very basic level, I can provide an, an input format or an output format that allows me to split up the data into uh, you know, sets that Hadoop can run MapReduce jobs over and output data back into the database. Uh, but Cassandra does more than that. Uh, because Cassandra um, has very flexible support for asynchronous replication, I can, I can split up my cluster into uh, you know, application uh, replicas in dark blue and Hadoop replicas in light green. And what this does for me is I, I can tell Cassandra now, make sure the data is replicated to both of these halves of the cluster. So each of them has their own copy. What that means now is I can run my analytical jobs in Hadoop and they will just touch the green nodes. So they won't interfere with anything going on serving up millions of requests per second to the users hitting my live website. So this, this gives me a workload separation where I don't need to worry about causing performance degradation to the application uh, that, that's important to my users. Um, another good example of uh, using Cassandra is Adobe's uh, Audience Manager product. So Audience Manager is kind of a content management system uh, for uh, analytics and online advertising. And they chose Cassandra for some of the same reasons uh, that eBay did, multi-data centers on there, but also some different ones. Uh, so looking at those a little bit, uh, the, the, at the top of Adobe's list was low latency, especially on reads. Um, so this is another place where uh, perception of Cassandra is, has lagged behind a little bit um, the actual 
um, product. Uh, so Cassandra has, you may have heard that Cassandra is fast at writes, uh, but not, not fast at reads. Uh, so this is, this is a production uh, Cassandra monitoring system. This isn't Adobe's cluster, but this is a, is a production uh, Cassandra cluster. Uh, and these are, these are the read latencies uh, for a, a, you know, three days in December. Uh, I guess it's actually five days. Um, but you can see the, that the latency, this is in milliseconds. So the latency average is about half a millisecond, a little less than half a millisecond. The 95th percentile latency, we have spikes up to um, you know, 500 microseconds, but very consistently uh, under a millisecond. So, so Cassandra can deliver this in the real world today. Um, we're, we're looking at making this even better uh, in 2.1. Uh, so the, the Cassandra 2.1 release is in beta 2 now, uh, looking to release it uh, next month. But here we have the a blue line. This is, this is a performance of uh, operations per second. Uh, in the blue line is 2.0 and the orange line is 2.1. So you can see that the, the absolute performance, I mean, it's, it's a little better in 2.1, it's maybe 5% better, but it's, it's about the same. But the important difference is that, is that it's much less variable. So in 2.0, we have some spikes where it, where it got worse during compactions, where it got worse during JVM garbage collections. In 2.1, it's much smoother. So, we're, so we're, you know, that's, that's an important value to us to provide consistently good performance, not just good performance on average. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about how Cassandra does this across a cluster and how we, how we spread uh, data across a cluster. So the, the fundamental uh, way we do this is, is called consistent hashing uh, on the uh, row's primary key. Um, it's, it's a little bit more complicated than that. It's actually, we actually use the first element of the primary key as the partition key. Uh, but in, a, in the simple case where it's not a compound primary key, they, you know, it, it equates to the same thing. Um, so I'm going to take, take this primary key here. My, my username is going to be my primary key in this example. And I'm going to hash it. And uh, earlier versions of Cassandra used MD5. Uh, we use Murmur hash now because it's faster. Um, it's important to note that we don't need a cryptographic hash. So we're totally fine with hash collisions because all we're doing is we're, we're using this hash to assign rows to replicas. It, it's, it, that, that's all we're using it for. So once, once we hash the, the primary keys, we're also going to assign numbers from our hash range to each of the nodes in our cluster. So here I've got four nodes in my cluster. I'm going to give the first one uh, token zero, the next one you know, token four, next one token eight, next one token C. So you know, counting up in hex along that 64-bit uh, space. Um, so I'm going to take those hash values that I computed with murmur hash, and I'm going to binary search across the tokens in my cluster to see which, ro which machine that row goes on. So Jim goes to node C, Carol goes to node D, Johnny goes to node A, and Susie goes to node C again. So this, this shows how we can pick a single replica uh, for each row. How do we generalize from that to multiple replicas. Um, there's, there's, actually, there's actually a um, pluggable component in Cassandra called the replication strategy uh, that handles this. And the, the simplest way is we can just say, well, if I picked you know, replica D for my first replica, I can just go around clockwise around the token ring and say nodes A and B are going to be my other two replicas. Um, but in, in practice, we want to be a little more sophisticated about this because we know that um, failures in real clusters are not random. They're correlated, and they're often correlated to physical location in your data center. Uh, so we allow you to tell Cassandra um, what data center and what rack each machine 
lives in. And that way we can make sure that we only have one replica per rack. And we'll make sure to scatter the replicas across multiple racks. And that way, if, if I have a switch failure, um, that, can, that can often take out an entire rack. A power failure, again, rack is often the unit of failure. Even if I have a cooler um, malfunction in the data center and machines near the cooler start overheating, you know, the rack is a useful abstraction that says, these machines are close together and I want the, the replicas far apart so I can avoid correlated failures. Um, I've oversimplified just a little bit here because I've been talking about a single token per node. And in practice, we split it up into hundreds of tokens per node. The principle is the same, but by, ha by splitting it up into lots of tokens per node, it lets us parallelize uh, operations across the cluster. So if I'm going to add a new machine to the cluster, we call this bootstrapping. So here I've, I've got the, the virtual nodes uh, as little squares uh, on, the, on the slide. And I'm going to, going to send some of those from each node to the new one. So I basically pick, uh, it's actually the new node that picks its tokens at random. Uh, but it results in uh, you know, a, a proportional amount of data being taken from each of the existing nodes and sent to the new one. So by, by doing this, my, the impact of doing that bootstrap is spread across the entire cluster rather than focused on just one or two. Um, this, this also impacts rebuilding a node. If I lose a machine and I need to rebuild it, I want to parallelize that across the cluster as much as possible. Um, so the, the end result would be that, that the new node has you know, the same amount of data as the original nodes, which all have, you know, lost a little bit of data by sending that to the new one. The last example I wanted to talk about uh, is Instagram, um, how they're using Cassandra. Uh, one of their uh, uh, key qualities they needed in a database was uh, durable writes. So in other words, if I send a write to, to Cassandra, if I do an insert and Cassandra says, yes, it is inserted, then if, even if I lose power, even if I lose an entire data center, that data should still be there when, when I recover. Uh, so the way Cassandra does that is similar to most relational databases where it has a commit log that writes get appended to before they get uh, acknowledged. So in the upper left, I'm updating a column in a row. Um, and so there's a dotted line dividing the slide. Below the line is on disk. Above the line is in memory. So I'm going to append it to the commit log. And then I'm going to put it in a structure in Cassandra's storage engine that's called a mem table. Uh, and in the mem table, I can group up updates to a single row efficiently. So notice here's, a, here's another column to the same row. So in the mem table, it's part of the same structure. In the commit log, there's two distinct entries because I never overwrite an entry in the commit log. I just append new information. That means that even if I'm on uh, a spinning disk, uh, rather than SSD, even if I'm on a, a, a magnetic hard disk, it's still very fast because I'm not having to do any seeks to move that uh, disk head around. So I'm going to do some more updates uh, to different rows. And uh, ultimately, my commit log gets full enough that I'm, that I'm ready to turn it into a data file on disk. Um, that's called a, a flush in the Cassandra storage engine. And so I turn it into a data file and I, I, I create an index and bloom filter for it. And once that's done, and once I've synced that to disk, then I'm, I don't need to keep those commit log entries around because the commit log's just there in case I need to replay from disk after a, uh, some kind of power failure. Uh, or maybe someone kill dash nine to the Cassandra process. You know, anything that, that causes it to stop uh, unceremoniously, that's what the commit log's there for. So now that I know it's, it's, it's durable on disk in the storage file, 
I, I don't need that commit log data anymore and I can clean that up. I can recycle the commit log segment and reuse it. Um, so Instagram reports that, that they have five, uh, six nines of availability on Cassandra, so 99.9999% availability. Um, there's uh, a number of different ways that Cassandra helps achieve that. I want to look at just one of those. So when I'm doing a read in a Cassandra cluster, the client sends its request to some Cassandra node. Uh, that, that becomes the coordinator for this request. So any node in the Cassandra cluster can be a coordinator. And in fact, it's good practice to uh, spread your requests across all the nodes in the cluster so that no single node becomes overloaded and becomes a bottleneck. Um, so any node in the cluster can be the coordinator. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a replica for that uh, row. And in fact, in this example, it's not a replica. So the coordinator, uh, each, each node in the cluster tracks how busy and how fast to respond the other nodes in the cluster are. So the coordinator knows there's three replicas and uh, it knows that, that uh, this one here is the fastest to reply recently. So it's going to route the request to that replica. And then the replica gives the coordinator the row and the coordinator gives it to the client. Um, so that, that's, that's the simple case when, when everything uh, goes according to plan. Now, a more interesting case is when the coordinator sends a request to a replica and then the replica dies uh, or it loses network connectivity or you know, something happens so that that replica can't respond uh, to the request. Now, in older versions of Cassandra, the coordinator would say, I couldn't do it, um, sorry about that. Uh, and it would send a timeout exception to the client. Uh, starting in 2.0, which is the, the current stable release, we added something called rapid read protection. So now when, when the coordinator's first request doesn't come back to it for any reason, it will perform additional requests uh, to other replicas and, and fail, over that, fail over within a single request. Um, so this is, this is actually configurable about how aggressive you want it to be. By default, it will retry the slowest 1% uh, of requests. But you can make it more aggressive even up to saying, always do uh, one more request than I have to for the consistency level that was requested. All, so, so by doing, doing that extra redundant request will give me uh, lower latency because now I just have to wait for whichever one gets back to me fastest as well as uh, providing f protection against failures. So here's what that looks like uh, in an experiment where we had a four node Cassandra cluster um, we're doing reads from it uh, as hard as we can. And then midway through it, we killed one of the nodes. Um, so uh, like I said, there's diff you can have different configurable levels of read protection. And those are the lines on the top, just different uh, uh, configurations of that. But the line that goes all the way to the bottom, that's with no read protection. So that's what happens when uh, it has to time out those requests uh, and, it, and it's not, not able to fail over um, until a new request comes in. So that's, that's been a big success for us uh, in 2.0. Uh, if I were to, to sum up uh, the last, uh, you know, the last you know, three, four years of Cassandra development, I'd say our core values have been uh, massive scalability, high performance, and uh, reliability. Uh, if, if you're curious, by the way, the graph on the right was from a, a paper published by researchers at the University of Toronto, uh, where they, they, uh, the x-axis is the number of nodes in the cluster, and the y-axis is the operations per second. And uh, it's an interesting paper. I would recommend checking it out. Uh, they did half a dozen different workloads. This one here is a mix of reads, writes, and sequential scans. 
Uh, and, and they broke that down into the different components in the paper. Um, so that's, that's kind of what we've delivered uh, in Apache Cassandra uh, you know, as kind of our mission statement for the first few years. Um, last year, we added a new core value of productivity and ease of use. Um, so we, we created a, a Cassandra query language based on SQL. Uh, these statements on the right are valid in both SQL and CQL. Uh, so create table, create index, select from where um, they have those in common. Uh, to, if the, the short version of CQL is Cassandra is a distributed system, so we're not going to support joins in the language. Joins are going to kill your performance in a distributed system. So we're going to emphasize denormalization instead. Uh, a second principle is that we're going to emphasize e eventual consistency instead of transactions. Now, sometimes you do need transaction-like func functionality, and I'll show you uh, Cassandra's answer to that in a little bit. Um, but fundamentally, eventual consistency lets you be, it lets you deliver availability and it lets you deliver performance much better than you can do if you're focused on acid transactions. Um, there's a great performance uh, by an engineer at Netflix uh, called Eventual Consistency is Not Hopeful Consistency. Um, it, that's a great introduction to this concept of, of uh, how eventual consistency is your friend. So just a quick taste of, uh, of CQL and how we, how we think about data modeling in Cassandra. If I have a, a user's table in a relational database and I want to allow users to have multiple email addresses, I'm going to create uh, an, an addresses table uh, with a many to one relationship to my users and then I'll, I'll pull those out at runtime with a join. So we, we, I already said we don't have joins in CQL by design. Um, so the, what we do instead is uh, we would use a collection to hold the email addresses. So I just inline that into the user row as a set. So, so you can see that I, my column definition here for email addresses is a set of text. So collections in Cassandra are typed. So in this case, it's a, it's a, a set of text entries. And then I can add email addresses to that row by doing this. So here I'm saying, take the union of the existing email addresses and these new ones. Now I could, I could also say replace, if I didn't have that email addresses plus, I could just say set email addresses equals this new set. Um, generally speaking, uh, it, this, if, if you're just uh, going to be obliterating what's already there and replacing it with a new collection, um, you know, that, I guess that's, that's fine and that's useful, but it's more useful to be able to incrementally and performantly add new entries to the collection. So unlike, uh, unlike uh, document databases, for instance, when I add new entries to the collection, I'm just writing that new entry. I'm not rewriting the entire row. Um, so I mentioned that sometimes you do need transaction-like functionality. So what I'm concerned about there is imposing uh, a linear view of operations on the database. Um, so an, an example uh, that I like to use is if you're allowing users to register for your application, um, then it, it, it's, it's, you need to be, you, you want to make very sure that only one user registers for a given name. So in a, in a, without some kind of transactions, I can't provide this. So here's what, that, here's, here's what an attempt to do this might look like without transactions. Um, one client asked Cassandra, does this user already exist? Cassandra says no. At the same time, 
Another user asks Cassandra, does this user exist? Cassandra says no. At the same time, the first user says, okay, well, since it didn't exist, I'm going to insert the row. The second user says, well, since it didn't exist, I'm going to insert the row as well. So what, what ends up happening in Cassandra is the second one ends up overriding the data from the first one because these could be happening on different replicas entirely or even in different data centers. So, so there's no, um, an insert in Cassandra is not, there's no concept of there's a uniqueness constraint that will reject uh, duplicate rows. So there, there's, that, that concept doesn't exist in Cassandra. So it's going to accept both of the inserts and then the, you know, one of them is going to overwrite the other. Um, so we added, we added a feature called lightweight transactions. And what that does is it lets you specify to Cassandra the, uh, the, the update and the condition uh, to check before performing that update uh, and, and wrap that into a single statement. So in this case, when we're inserting new rows, uh, that, that check is just at the bottom here, if not exists. So if I say insert, if not exists, and I have multiple uh, uh, clients doing this at the same time, one of them will get uh, uh, a success result, which is, uh, it, you know, it'll get back a result set that says applied is true. The other will get back applied is false. And then as, as extra information, here's the row that already exists that you thought didn't exist. And so now it's up to you, the application, to decide, do you want to update the existing row or do you want to insert a different row? So you've got that information now. Um, so to, you know, when, when you're uh, updating instead of inserting, then your, your if statement can include existing column values. Uh, so I can check uh, column values uh, that are, it's restricted to a single partition. So remember I said that, that partitions are the unit of how we spread data across the cluster. So by restricting lightweight transactions to a single partition, that means I know that I only need to coordinate across one set of replicas. I don't need to coordinate across you know, the entire cluster. Uh, so that, that lets me uh, provide boundaries on uh, you know, how, how concurrent I can, I can make this without getting into trouble. So under the hood, Lightweight transactions are built on Paxos, which gives us uh, some very desirable properties from Cassandra's perspective. First of all, it's quorum-based, meaning as long as I have a majority of the replicas for that partition, I can make progress. So it's, it's, totally, so it's totally okay for some replicas to be down as long as I still have a majority. So that's important for Cassandra's goals of delivering availability. Uh, Paxos state is also durable. So even if I, I start a lightweight transaction um, and partway through the coordinator dies, that's, that's still going, that's not going to affect my correctness. I'm, I'm going to be able to uh, finish that with, with a new leader. Um, if you, for those of you who said you're already using Cassandra, uh, we added a new consistency level for this. Consistency level dot serial means I'm doing a read and I want that read to you know, peer into the lightweight transaction machinery and, and let me know what that most recent value is uh, as, you know, as even including lightweight transactions that are in process of being committed. Um, down at the bottom though is the big you know, danger warning sign language. We're doing four round trips between each replica and the coordinator for a lightweight transaction. So it's lightweight in the sense that it doesn't perform locking and lightweight in the sense that there's no begin transaction, commit or rollback. It's, it's rolled into a single statement. It's not lightweight in the performance sense. So 
uh, you know, the, the, the wrong conclusion from this would be, hey, I've got lightweight transactions, so I'm going to build my entire application using this. That would be the wrong lesson. The right lesson is it's available for when you really need it and when the alternative is you know, corruption or inflicting Zookeeper on yourself. Um, so yeah, th those of you who have used Zookeeper know what I'm talking about. Yes. So did I understand it properly that in order for the transaction or conflict to be detected, the, the reader actually needs to say, I want to be aware of conflicting transactions with the serialized level? No. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, let, let me take questions offline because I, I only have five minutes or three minutes now. Um, uh, so uh, coming up in 2.1, I want to just give you a quick taste of, of what is about to be released uh, next month. Um, so I, I, I showed you collections earlier. Collections do not nest. I cannot have a map of sets or a set of lists. But in 2.1, I can create my own types, which could contain collections, and then I can have collections of my type. So if you look here, my, my address type contains a set of phone numbers. My user type contains a map of addresses. And so, the, so that gives me this nestability, but, now it, but, it, but it's strongly typed now. So I, don't, I, I, I get that benefit of a strong schema as well as the ability to build a structure in my database that matches my object hierarchy. So, and, I, and I can pull out uh, different pieces of those types with CQL. So the query here, I'm pulling out the city field and phone field uh, from uh, uh, the, the addresses. And that's what I get back uh, for one of my users. Um, we've also added indexing to collections. So here I've got a, a set of text for my tags column in my songs table. And then I can create an index on that tags column and use that in a query. Notice that, that we've added a new keyword here, though. So we've added the contains keyword. Uh, we, could have used, we could have reused the existing in keyword, and then I could have said where blues in tags. I could have, I could have reversed that to use the in keyword. Uh, we went with contains because um, maps are a special case, because maps have keys and values. So by default, uh, or, or rather when you use the contains keyword on a map, it's going to check the values. But we also added the contains keys keyword that will let you check um, the keys of, of the map collection as well. Uh, so beta 2 is out now if you want to play with 2.1. Uh, we're, we're hoping to do a release candidate next week and get the final out uh, for the end of June. Uh, finally, I just wanted to give you a heads up for some other Cassandra talks at Berlin Buzzwords. Uh, later today, uh, Gary Dusbabic from Rackspace is talking about Blue Flood, which is a metrics processing system built on Cassandra. Um, also later today is a uh, talk on the Cassandra Java driver. Uh, tomorrow we have one on time series with Cassandra and a longer data modeling talk. So the data modeling talk tomorrow is an 80-minute an session and we'll be able to get into some more details on doing uh, Cassandra modeling. And then finally, not part of Berlin Buzzwords, but also in Berlin, uh, tomorrow at 7 p.m., we're doing a Cassandra users meetup. It's about 15 minutes away. Uh, and and it, you know, if you Google for Berlin Cassandra meetup, there it is. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll be happy to take questions. I'll, you can find me at the, the Datastax booth in the sponsors uh, room. And uh, thanks for your time and enjoy the conference.